Welcome to Virtual Wednesdays. My name is Francesca D'Alessio, and I'm so glad you could join us tonight. In partnership with the Association of Ramatisha Ohlone, tonight we present the first of a three-part series focused on honoring the Ohlone history, culture, and land. Tonight, Jonathan Cordero, chair of the Association of Ramatisha Ohlone, and Greg Castro, principal cultural consultant, discuss the cultural and spiritual significance of land to the Ramaytush Ohlone peoples. Before we begin tonight, this presentation offers an opportunity to share the museum's land acknowledgement that recognizes and pays respect to the indigenous peoples of the land where our two museums, the De Young and the Legion of Honor, are so impressively situated in Golden Gate Park and Lincoln Park right here in San Francisco. We present this acknowledgement to raise awareness of the enduring relationship of the Ohlone community to its land in the Bay Area and to underline our role as a museum that fosters inclusivity among the communities that we serve. Take it away, Jonathan. Sorry about that. <laughs> First shout to he, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, we are going to save a lot of time for questions today. So please uh, save those up for the end. Um, but I want to introduce myself and my colleague, Greg Castro. So my name is Jonathan Cordero. I am the founder and executive director of the Association of Ramatush Ohlone. We are the original peoples of the San Francisco Peninsula. Greg Castro uh, is our culture director, and he is going to open it us up with a song. Urshatuhi. Greetings in the language of our ancestors. And as Jonathan said, I'm Greg Castro. I'm Totral Slinen, Rumson, and Ramatushaloni. And Hayene uh, Hersha Pesha Walrap, Ramatushaloni, welcome to the homeland of the Ramatushaloni, is uh, something that is relatively new that we get to say nowadays uh, and that people hear us. And uh, that is an important step uh, back for us. I want to start out uh, as our ancestors and elders have taught me in a good way, as we say, uh, with a song for, for us, songs, stories, dance are pr all prayers. And what we use them for is to continually renew our connection to the earth that gave birth to us, the homeland, the uh, ancestors and the culture that uh, makes us continue to thrive and the people around us, our own relatives, and uh, all the people that are now on our land as well. And it's important we maintain a uh, relationship uh, with each other, especially during the hard times. And we certainly seem to be going through some challenging times right now. I'm gonna sing a song from my cousins in the Rumson area of Monterey Bay. Uh, this is an Ohlone song um, that is for the fog. And uh, I also use it to clear the air and to clear our hearts and minds so that we can engage in conversation. Arapa chitia huan, wasia him. 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 Ara pa 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 chitia huan, wasia him. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, I'd like to spend just a little bit of time sharing with you all the primary purposes of our organization. So 
just a list really of five things. And then we will transition into the topic, which is to talk about um, what land means to us as native peoples of the San Francisco Peninsula. The five areas uh, of purpose in our organization are in, in, in not, uh, not, not distinct order here, are um, the rematriation of the land uh, first, and second would be uh, the revitalization both of our culture and our community, second. And third, a group of three, uh, research, consultation, and education. And then the last two evolve out of our responsibilities as Native peoples to uh, four, care for the earth, and number five, to care for the people who reside in our ancestral homeland. And the reason I am not saying uh, care for our members is because there are very few, if any, members that we're aware of who actually live in our ancestral homeland because of the displacement of the Ramaytushaloni peoples. So caring for, uh, caring for the earth manifests itself in our work in ecological restoration and caring for people it manifests itself in the various things that we do to care for people in regards to our service activities, our activism, uh, and any kind of healing that we are involved in. Just to, to give you a, a sense of our history very briefly, um, there were about 2,000 Ramatishaloni peoples who occupied the San Francisco Peninsula before the Spanish arrived in 1769. And by the end of the mission period, uh, there were probably only about um, you know, 30-ish families left over. And by about 1910, there was really only one lineage from the entire San Francisco Peninsula who had survived up to that point. That is our lineage. There are four branches of, the fa of that family and Greg and I come from, uh, from two of those branches. So our ancestors, of course, as, you, as many of you well know, experienced uh, dispossession, displacement, uh, genocide in terms of the loss of people, cultural genocide, of course. And then after the missions were closed, uh, most California Indians were dispersed across the state. And we have more or less been dealing with perpetual structural poverty and all ob the obstacles that come with it as a result. Our primary goal or one of our primary goals in the work that we're doing is to try to get back to the San Francisco Peninsula and reconstitute ourselves as a people. And so one of the questions we, we sort of pose rhetorically is, um, is this, how can we ever be whole as a people if we're not living in the land of our ancestors? So uh, Greg is gonna take over now and talk to you about what land means to us as native peoples, um, because typically you know, given our experience, it does differ uh, from the way that most other folks we work with talk about land. Hi, it's Bonnie Khan, thank you. Um, where can I start? Well, here's what I'm gonna give a shot at. We attended uh, a meeting. Uh, we were invited to speak to a group of, of artists this last Sunday. And I remember walking into the room of their uh, artist building uh, where we were going to uh, meet with each other. And on the wall, there were a bunch of posters. And on the posters were various topics that they are, were apparently going through a deep dive into why they were doing whatever it is they were doing. And what struck me is that some of the same questions that I saw on the, posed on those posters were the same questions I had actually addressed two days before in an organizational meeting, because we're going through many of the same processes and have been for quite some time. Um, and one thing that also struck me that um, even though it's in English and not in Ramatush, um, you know, concepts, convey across language barriers, um, but also can get filtered quite a bit. But some concepts don't translate at all. And what I've found in the 30 plus years I've been working in the California native community is that uh, we often, because 
most of us grow up with English in the modern times. Uh, some California native people are fortunate to be able to speak some of their own language, but they mostly convey their ideas and conversation in English nowadays. And as the saying goes, things get lost in translation. And I think also what happens is that, that we express ourselves differently. So it's not that the things we talk about or other people talk about are radically different or wrong or not how we would say it. But it's often an, a layer that is something we engage in, but there's another layer beyond that. And talking about land is a perfect example. We use the terms of, you know, owning land. It's our land. Use it in a possessive sense. But when we look at our la the languages of California, when you translate ours or a possessive, it doesn't have the same meaning. And one way that's reflected is that our elders tell us that when we talk about our land, we don't talk about it as a object that we possess, but as an elder, a relative that we have responsibility to and commitments to and obligations for. And particularly in this case, the land itself, our stories tell us that we came from that place. At the beginning of the world, we were brought into the world by the first people. I know sometimes we're referred to as first people, but when we use that term, we're talking about the real first people. What other people refer to as eagle, bear, deer, those animal people. But they were much more than that to us. They had powers conveyed to them by creator to help shape the world that creator put here. And they shaped it often for the purpose of then conveying it to us. The creator told them there will be other beings coming after them, and you will teach them how to take care of the world, how to steward the world that gave birth to them, and teach them their sacred obligation and commitment to continue doing that so that the world will take care of them. And so that's how we are taught culturally to look at the world that we live in. It is a relative, an elder relative, and we are obligated to take care of that relative because it took care of us for so long, brought us into a world that is beautiful, even in its current state. It is still a beautiful, wondrous land that still can take care of us, that still nurtures us, that still gives us life and sustenance and the culture that we still yearn for. And even though in a particular case of the Ramatush people, a lot of that culture has been taken from us and much of it hidden from us, much of it is asleep for us. We, it is still there and it still does not alleviate the obligation and commitment we have to be the proper stewards of the land that gave us birth. Our culture also tells us that we should be the stewards of all the people on it. And whether by lack of, of knowledge and foresight or not, the elders and ancestors didn't tell us there were going to be other people here. So for us, that may, doesn't make any difference. People are here and whoever's here, it is our sacred obligation to take care of the land and take care of the people on that land. We also speak in terms of, of the land in a different way, that we are not on the land, but we are of the land. And sometimes in a deeper sense, the land is on us and within us. Our origin stories often speak in California that we are brought into the world and made from parts of that land. My father's Salinan people south of the Ohlone in central California have stories that we were brought into the world at the base of a sacred mountain origin place. And we were made from elderberry that grew on that sacred mountain. And then through ceremony, the first people assisted creator in bringing life into those elderberry, breathing spirit into those elderberry that then came alive and became the newcomers into that land at the beginning of the world and the first people taught them 
about how to take care of that place. And if as long as they took care of that place, it would take care of them. I imagine they didn't foresee way far in the distance future that there would be a time like we've experienced the last 250 years. In archaeological terms, we know we've been here at least 10,000 years, much more likely 15, and our stories tell us since the beginning of time. And it's only been in the last almost blink of an eye, 250 years, that the newcomers have come and disrupted that ancient tradition of caretaking the land. But we have come through that gauntlet and we are still here. We are still committed. We have not forgotten. We have not ceded. We have not forsaken that obligation to take care of the land. And so however we can, wherever we can, we still do that. We can do it in whichever way, you know, creator puts in front of us, whether that's visiting the land, whether it's engaging with whoever is in modern terms, the current owners to help manage that land through contractual means, through agreements, through understandings, through MOUs and MOAs and all the modern convenience, conveniences of doing that. Or even in modern terms, ownership, as in being deeded land. All those ways are tools that we use to exercise our sacred commitment and obligation to take care of the place that took care of us since the dawn of time. And what we're seeing nowadays and understanding is that even though we're kind of pressured and pushed into speaking in terms of English that doesn't convey our cultural understandings, that one of the ways that we address that is events like this, where we talk with the public and, and remind the public that even though we're using those modern English terms of land ownership, we uh, understand the concepts behind land back, land acknowledgement, um, returning to the land. All those other things, we use those terms often because if we used our indigenous terms, almost no one would understand us. So it's almost an internal translation that we have to go through. But I think we're at the stage now where it's important for us to convey a deeper meaning. And, and in these times, we're finding out that people are ready to hear that. That's what we found last Sunday with this group where we spent hours talking about these and, and answering questions. And we hope to do that tonight as well. Um, so we, the, I, I love the, our young people have adapted much better than us old fogies like myself. And they use terms like code switching. And that's how I understand code switching to really mean where we live in two worlds. That's how we used to say it back in the day. Uh, we, we live in two worlds, we have feet in two worlds and we go back and forth. And um, that is a, a constant challenge for us. But I think what, what we now want to do is maybe step a little more into our own world and welcome people onto our side to have a deeper meaning and understanding, particularly during these times when the world has been deeply wounded and needs healing. And a lot of people agree with us that we are one way that we can bring that healing to the world that we can all benefit from. In fact, we need for our very survival. All right, Spanikan, thank you. Jonathan? Yeah, and I just wanted to add to that too. I think Greg and I, we've been having this conversation with, with the public and, and other folks for quite a long time now. And one of the things that we're realizing has become useful in our discussions in trying to convey our understanding of the world from a native perspective is to, is to use uh, use the English language as it is um, to, to try to convey some of those differences in orientation to the world and, and to just being in the world. And so Greg, Greg started by pointing out the difference in the ways that we talk. And so I'll just take the, the first one uh, again. You know, uh, and, and these, are, these are generalizations. So there, there are lots of exceptions here, but for the most part, you know, native peoples, we talk about being of a place not from a place. And there's a radical difference as Greg was, was, was articulating. 
right? Um, Non-native peoples often talk about doing things, you know, to nature, um, which is a type of domination. And native peoples talk about doing things with nature, right? Which is more of a partnership, right? Because we understand the interconnectedness of all things and the need to maintain balance and harmony. Um, there's a there's an American Indian scholar of religion who who uh, again this is a gross over uh, generalization, but you you'll get the point who said, uh, you know, non-native people go to church to talk to God. Native people go, well, in this case, nature is church, go to church to listen to God. And in this case, God is mother earth, right? So, so you know, uh, you know, Europeans are talking in, in church, native peoples are listening. And there's a radical difference in, in orientation. Again, that's a gross generalization, but you get the point. Uh, we talk about stewarding land, or holding land. And we really try to avoid using the word ownership because of the, uh, the, the ideas that it conveys. And we've been doing lots of land acknowledgement statements. And one thing that is really important for, for everyone to understand is that land acknowledgement statements are not primarily for native peoples. They're for all of you to understand that you are on another person's unceded ancestral homeland. Um, and in the context of lots of land acknowledgement statements, again, we, we try to play with the language, again, to get people to think about things in a way that might make them uncomfortable or might at least challenge their, their way of thinking or being in the world. So for example, lots of folks who write land acknowledgement statements say things like, we're guests uh, on Ramatish Ohlone territory. Okay, well, what's a guest? A guest is someone who is invited and who eventually leaves. So are you really a guest? Um, and maybe settler is a better word for that, but that has some serious kind of political implications as a term and is uncomfortable. Um, that said, Greg and I really understand the, the spirit behind saying you're a guest on someone else's land. Uh, so we're not going to poke too hard at you in regards to that, but we do we do appreciate the efforts that folks are making in regards to the land acknowledgement statements, and the land acknowledgement statements are not uh, the beginning and end of anything for us. We're we're starting to call this land acknowledgement plus because we hope that the relationship we build with the entity in in doing a land acknowledgement will turn into a burgeoning relationship where we can help each other. Um, or work together to help the community. So we're trying to turn something that is technically just symbolic into something much more. And uh, Native peoples are all about building relationships and that's very important to us. Just a quick review before we uh, turn it out over for questions. We, we are actively involved in activities related to Mother Earth in our territory and again, that primary manifests itself in the ecological restoration work that we're doing in both San Francisco and San Mateo counties. If any of you have questions about that, we can certainly talk about it more. Um, but but as, as hopefully you can now understand, it's not just land to us. Um, you know, our relationship to the earth defines us as a people, our orientation to the earth is different from most other people. And so it's, it is interesting to see, I'm an academic, and it's interesting to see this change also in the scientific community. People are recognizing that cultural diversity and biological diversity go hand in hand. They always have. So why have we been separating them? And there are some challenges there for some of the groups who, you know, in quotation marks, manage the land when we begin to understand that. Um, but as Greg said, people are beginning to awaken and realize that indigenous peoples actually have, and we've had for a very long time, uh, key, a key uh, knowledge, right, traditional ethnological knowledge, and an orientation to the world that is actually beneficial for folks who manage our land. And that includes you know, groups like land trusts and ecological restoration groups. So we will, uh, Greg, did you wanna add anything? Um, I, I think that 
it, it's just important to know that that these are concepts that we kind of throw around and it's hard to bridge the two and and i think what i would say is that our elders taught us not to get stuck in what we believe in a in a rigid way but to have it as a fluid knowledge base in which to engage in the world however it however it exists at that time now for thousands of years our world did not dramatically change and when the europeans came that's what they kind of like faulted us for as being uh you know a primitive people that stayed the same forever well, that's because our world stayed the same and we found over the last 250 years you know native people in california can radically adapt when they need to and they've needed to and so our thinking is also adapting evolving changing and and engaging in a different way with the public that's around us and uh that's the the hopeful and fruitful part of the work we do and that, and that goes hand in hand again, and we'll, we'll turn it over to, to the audience for questions after this, but that goes hand in hand with the idea that, um, that Native peoples are, you know, we're, we're really living or in, in two worlds, if you will, uh, the traditional world and the modern world. Uh, you know, we're starting a nonprofit with a land trust. So uh, a nonprofit is not a traditional Native, uh, you know, uh, organization. So we, we live in both worlds and um, we'll never get back to the way things were. Um, so we have to make some compromises in our traditions to live in the world that we do today. And, and that's a part of the challenge, I think, of being native in the world today is we understand what life was like in the past to the best of our ability, but here we are now today in the present. And, and, and in some cases, the question is, what is the best that we can do given our current circumstances? And can we also, of course, in the political work that we do, can we also change some of those things as well or challenge some of those systems that constrain us uh, as Native peoples? So with that, we will turn it to, over to the audience for questions. And we have until about 5.40, 5.45 to field your, your questions. So uh, the first question is, um, you know, can we, uh, we prepared a, a primer on terminology so that uh, folks can make some distinctions, especially in the, in the Bay Area and especially in the San Francisco Peninsula, between the terms Costanoan and Ohlone and Ramaytush and Yalamu. So on our website, www.ramaytush.org, uh, there is a place where you can go and under resources, click on the button that says terminology. And there's a short, about eight minute video that explains the differences uh, and definitions and distinctions among those terms. And um, let's, Greg, how about we answer this one? Uh, how are land acknowledgements changing relationships and dynamics of power as California Indians assert their land rights? Why don't you go ahead and start with that one? That, that's an interesting uh, question, and it's constantly changing. I mean, land acknowledgments probably weren't even known about more than four years ago, five years ago. And just in the last year and a half, 2020 to, to, to now, um, they've dramatically changed. And in both quality, depth, and certainly quantity, whereas uh, probably a couple of years ago, we may have got one or two a year. Now we get one or two a week, if not daily. And um, certainly at, at some point uh, late last year into early this year, uh, to use the more gentle term, they were somewhat performative. Uh, if, if those people over there are doing it, we probably should do it too. But uh, Jonathan encouraged people to give it thought. Um, when we do ceremony, it's not just motions. It's not just acts. It is an expression of our deeper feelings. So not to criticize modern times or religions, but having experienced both, I know that when we do something in ceremony in native circles, um, it has to have real meaning 
or it me or it means nothing and the performance you put around it the mechanics the logistics are secondary they have importance too especially if they're well thought and attached over time to the thoughts that are behind it the meaning behind it and we wanted to do that with land acknowledgements we didn't want just somebody to to say okay we're opening the meeting uh who's gonna say the land acknowledgement and okay we said the land acknowledgement now let's start the meeting uh which did happen for a lot of people and still does to a certain extent but we wanted people to really think about it and and really in a sense i certainly had the thought that if they didn't want to put thought into it about how it applied to the work they did in the community to whatever organization decided to do this how it meant to them and how they would then take that understanding into the community in the work that what they did whatever it was whether it was arts music uh po politics social whatever they happen to be what did the land acknowledgement mean for them and that's where it morphed into land plus as land acknowledgement plus as jonathan indicated and i give credit to jonathan because i i didn't think it would happen but he put things on our website that really urged people to think at it at a deeper level and that's what it started to happen it certainly generated a lot more work for us because people were starting to do what we asked is is think deeper about a land acknowledgement and have it as the beginning of a relationship and relationships take work so it, it is more work for us but it's what we asked for and what i think is required in a moral ethical sense uh by the work we do and by the work other people do thanks greg uh then the next question is uh when we want to do calls for action after we make our land acknowledgement um, what do you suggest are actions we can all take? And um, that's a really important question also, by the way, because when we do land acknowledgement statements with various groups um, and all different kinds of organizations um, that take multiple forms, by the way. So, so for example, the group we met with on Sunday is a performance, uh, a group of performance artists. And so they're gonna do a land acknowledgement statement as a performance. Some people turn it into a, you know, a poem, right? Some, it's, for some, it's this, you know, very official document. Um, so, so it takes it takes a lot of different forms. But the the plus, the actions that people can take with land acknowledgments, really depend upon the organization and what it has to offer, and what we need, or maybe in some cases, what the community needs. So uh, there's no there's no clear answer here. So Land acknowledgement statements aren't really designed to benefit native peoples in a sense. We, we appreciate this, the recognition. Uh, land acknowledgement statements are for non-native people to realize the privilege that they have of working on and living on someone else's uh, stolen land effectively. And what are your obligations uh, as a result of that? Um, and so, a good way of framing this question for, for me, if I was to turn this back around on you, I would, I would ask, how, does the, how do the ideas in the land acknowledgement statement live in your everyday life and your place of work? How do they, how do they live in those areas of your life? Uh, and so if, if you work for uh, a particular organization, you have a particular set of resources and they're not useful to the native peoples here, us, the ARO, um, then we suggest that you go find a, a, a native community or another community uh, and offer your services to them. Um, there's one group, for example, the AIDS Ride in California who called us and, and wanted to help us. And we said, no, <laughs> we will help you because we really value the work that they're doing and it's incredibly important. Um, and so in, in this case, the land acknowledgement turned into what the ARO, what native people can do to help uh, raise money to help uh, you know, resolve some of the problems with, uh, with AIDS across the board. So uh, it takes lots of different forms. There's no one answer. And it really just is a matter of us sitting down with you and talking about possibilities and, and seeing where that goes. Um, Let, let me give this to Greg to start. Greg, here's a, here's a question for you. How can those of us 
managing land in San Francisco partner with you in that stewardship? Oh, throw me the hot one. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, you know, certainly, you know, contacting us uh, through our website, um, I, I think it's important to know that th there's a few of us and a lot of you <laughs> and we're in startup mode. And so um, we uh, want to form partnerships that enhance both our knowledge in the work that you do and your own knowledge in what you do, uh, maybe a different way of looking at things. So in terms of land um, and, and management, um, we can, you know, we're starting to build up our website where we can add some resources that people can see. I've added a, a couple already. I'm going to try to add a few more in the chat. Um, I, I think just this applies especially to this topic, but it applies also to all topics. Um, there is now a lot of information out on the internet. As we have experienced in the last year or two, it can be dangerous to go out on the internet, depending on who you happen to reach out to and, and acquire knowledge from. So there needs to be discernment, whatever you do, especially in California Indian country. But um, there's a couple of websites that I think you can start. And I think it's a journey to acquaint yourself with the history and the conditions, including the current conditions and status of communities across California, and certainly in whatever area that you're working. Um, and I've been working with one particular ecological restoration group. It's called Ecological Restoration Camps. Started in Europe, and they've started a chapter now in California. And they're kind of sprinkled around the state. And early on, um, somebody asked that question, how do you engage the people in your area if there's no one there? And my, my answer was, yes, there is somebody there. Almost certainly, there's going to be somebody in that area. They're just not visible to you. And it it's not something that you can go to the yellow pages and look up the local Indians. Um, and there's lots of reasons and important reasons why that's true, why the people are not visible uh, still, uh, because there were certainly dark times where it was dangerous to be native, dangerous to reveal ourselves. And so it's been a journey for many communities, even up to present times, to reveal themselves and engage back within their own communities. Uh, but they're out there, and uh, we hope to contribute to that list and have some of those people on our website. Um, so that's sort of the more general uh, idea. And as I said, I'm going to post some in the chat where you can engage those. Um, that It's a learning process. One thing I recommend is KCET is a public uh, uh, station down in Southern California, and they have a wonderful series of videos uh, from all throughout California uh, that I think you people would really learn a lot from if they took the time. And they're usually relatively short videos, so you can go back and, you know, uh, engage again and again. Uh, but it's a whole series of them that they've done over the last few years that I think is a really important resource just to get your general idea of what it is like in Native California today. Thank you, Greg. And uh, another question, actually, I'll put two together that are related to the same topic. Uh, one, one person asks, can we join you in caring for the land? And the answer is yes, and I want to explain that in more detail. And then what kinds of partnerships within your ancestral homelands are or would be transformative for us? Um, and the easy answer to that question, the latter question, is rematriation. In other words, giving the land back. Um, but there are lots of obstacles in place to our acquiring land, even if someone wanted to just give it to us. Um, I was having a conversation this weekend about this very topic. It's one thing to say, hey, we've got some land and we want to give it to you. That's wonderful. But the management and care for that land does require additional resources, which at present we do not have. So we would not be able to accept that gift. It's very similar to folks who say, hey, you know, the Natural History Museum has lots of your stuff in storage. You should, you know, lobby to get that stuff. Okay, but we don't have the facility or the training to manage the, uh, that, those uh, cultural materials. So, so it's one thing to say, hey, I can give you a gift. It's another to, for that gift to then become a burden on us. 
And so that's, that is a challenge for us. And we have to build capacity in order to be able to receive certain kinds of gifts. But in regards to the first question, uh, which is about, you know, can, can we join you in caring for the land? Again, on Sunday with this amazing performance artist group that we worked with, there was a really interesting question that came up. And uh, the, the sort of uh, summary is, is essentially, we were all indigenous at one point. We likely all had a direct relationship with the earth and similar kinds of teachings. So everyone has the capacity to understand what it means to be responsible for caring for the earth. This is our ancestral homeland. So we have a kind of uniqueness and a unique responsibility in caring for the land here. But all of you can share in that responsibility. You will likely understand it differently, but the responsibility is nonetheless the same. So can you join us in partnership? The answer is absolutely yes. And to add to what Greg said earlier, most of the work that we accomplish within our organization is done in partnership because we don't have the kind of expertise in many cases uh, to be able, for example, to put together uh, you know, an ecological restoration project um, you know, in a particular area because we don't have access to land, we don't have the necessary resources. We do use scientific expertise in addition to uh, native expertise as well. So it's always a group effort. It always has been. Um, so, so we appreciate those offers. And uh, I would say, you know, just if you're interested, get in contact with us. We'll tell you about the multiplicity of projects that we're working on uh, and, and see if, uh, if we can find a way to work together on some of those projects. Um, one, I think we have time maybe for one or two more questions. Uh, how about this one? Uh, are you advocating for curriculum changes in California schools? That one's, let's not, actually, let's not answer that one because that's not about land. Um, someone's asking, is there a way that you can support us financially? So Greg, take it away. Well, we have a, uh, a magic button on our website. <laughs> That's one way. Um, we um, borrowed the excellent idea of our relative from across the bay, Karina Gould, who uh, kind of came up with the idea of a land tax, which in the Chechenyo language of the East Bay, they call shumi. Um, and we have a similar concept here. Um, so that's that can take many forms of ongoing not a small amount, but ongoing. It could be uh, a large amount, a bequeathed, um, and and a one-time deal. Also, we're 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 accepting those kinds of donations on our website. Um, we have a sponsorship, and and we'll soon have uh, nonprofit status um, that uh, will give uh, tax uh, benefits for those who decide to donate, and. Um, I, I think that uh, we have uh, an obligation to be careful of the generosity of the public that's supporting us as we are careful with the land that we've been entrusted of stewarding. So um, I can assure you it'd be put to good use and hopefully there will be details as we go along on our website. Thank you. Um, last question. How can museums and cultural institutions support this work in the Bay Area? And the answer is we're doing it right now. Uh, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco is sponsoring this event. And this is a series in which uh, Ohlone folks are talking about their relationship to land. All of our relationships and, and emphases differ. Um, but I think anything you can do to help us raise awareness and that raising of awareness in a, in a situation like this helps us, uh, helps people find out about us. And then we can work together uh, on projects um, as we are able. So that's, that's one of the ways in which uh, you can help us by sharing our links you know, for financial support, by uh, inviting us in to give a presentation or a talk, which again, will hopefully develop into a relationship 
uh, in which we can help one another attain our, our goals. So anything that is like that um, is, is helpful for us. And the next program is, uh, is September 8th with Karina Gould from Sogarea Tay. So that will be coming up in about a month. And then again in November on the 14th uh, with Indian Canyon. I think that's all we have time for. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much to Jonathan Cordero and Greg Castro. That was such an insightful conversation. And of course, a huge thank you to the Association of Ramai Tushaloni. It is a pleasure to build with you. Please read our description on the website for more information on this program. And please join us for Virtual Wednesdays on September 8th and November 10th for the next two episodes in this series. And of course, thank you so much for supporting Virtual Wednesdays. We hope to see you next week.